Father, we're so thankful for the District Heights Church of Christ and all of the members who serve here in this congregation. We're thankful, Lord, for Brother Hubbard and Sister Hubbard for 28 years of laboring here in this local congregation, for them having the vision and the un un intestinal fortitude to establish the church, to develop the church, and encourage the church to the point where it is right now. Thank you, Lord, for their lives. Thank you for their ministry. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give him continued wisdom. Help Nell to be a great help me to and give her wisdom as well. We pray for the leaders of this church and those who are striving to be leaders in the kingdom. We pray, Father, that you will bless them according to their faith. And we ask you to bless this entire congregation. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. But before we close, Father, we ask you to be with your servant. Use his mouth as a mouthpiece to proclaim your eternal truth so that your word will not return to you void, so that it will accomplish the purpose wherewith you sent it. And we'll do everything we can to make sure you receive all the glory. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Let's all say amen. Okay, one thing you learned on last night. One thing you learned on one night. All right, go right ahead. Let's get a, let me get the mic to you. So we can have a robin mic. There's the robin mic right back there. Go right ahead. Um, that we are a theocratic government with Jesus, of course, or God being the head of the church and the evangelist being the person on earth that is the, the guidance for the church and then we all work at the hand together to make the church thrive. Look at that. She didn't even read her notes. I mean, she got that concept. Let's give her a love deposit, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the Lord's church is a theocratic government. It is not a democratic government. One of the things that's caused the problems in our churches is we've been operating based on a democratic form of government, which is of the people, for the people, and by the people. Therefore, the people think they got the decision making on how the church supposed to run. We've been using all kind of concepts, IBM and, and Xerox and KFC and school systems and government models. The Bible teach that there's a biblical model. And if we got one church, then you got one biblical model. And that biblical model is that is a theocratic government. Theo means what? God. And cratic means what? The system that God has created. Where is your Bible for that, Rose? Romans chapter 13, verse number one. Let every soul be subject to the higher power. For there is no power other than that which God has ordained. And the powers that be are ordained of God. Well, what are those? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But we'll, 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 we, we know that that evangelist really has been given the authority to develop and train elders and deacons. Now, this evangelist is not supposed to be spending all this time trying to keep the power within himself or trying to make sure that he is lording it over the church. He's supposed to be developing leaders and developing people in the church. And when you do it, he then becomes uh, uh, the role of the evangelist. He stays in his lane and the role of the elders, they stay in their lane and the deacons stay in their lane. And if everybody stay in their lane, we won't be having the problems we have in church. Amen. Let's give her one more love deposit. All right. Someone else. All right. One thing you learned, okay, last night. Is it not on? Well, let me help you. Last night I learned to appreciate my leader uh, uh, and, and, and his sacrifice that he's made for the church. Yes. The brother, he's talking about Brother Hubbard? Yeah. Brother Evangel. Let me tell you something. One of the greatest challenges in the church, when members of the church don't know the role of the evangelist, they think he's trying to dominate, control, like he's trying to take over everything. He has been given authority by God to set in order the things that are warning in the church and ordain elders in every city, in every church. That's his responsibility. And if he is, if he's following the leading of the Holy Spirit, then he has to lead. 
that evangelist has to be able to lead the church. He may say to you, brother, would y'all come to the front? Or he may ask you to do this and have ask you to do that. What he's saying is we learn to respect the role of the evangelist. That's why the Bible says, know them that labor among you. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 12. Know them that labor among you and esteem them or respect them highly, watch this now, for their work's sake. Well, what's the work of the evangelist? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Let me back up and show y'all some of the things that's there. Preach the word. You got to preach it when people want to hear it and when people don't want to hear it. Reprove. You know what that means? To find fault. Rebuke. You know what that means? To censor sharply. Sometimes you got to censor sharply to help people to look. Reprove, rebuke, exalt. Some lessons you preach, you just exhort. So you got to know how to preach the different kind of lessons that's necessary to help the church to grow. Sometimes the minister got to get up and say, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we're not doing our job. We're supposed to be out here teaching the gospel to people out in the world, and we're not helping bringing anybody to church. He got to rebuke sometime, and he got to exalt sometime. And for the time will come, the Bible says, when they will not endure sound doctrine. It says men will not endure sound doctrine. You know, that tells me a church got to learn how to endure sound doctrine. What does that mean? The church got to be able to hear solid preaching. And sometimes solid preaching don't make you feel good. Sometimes preaching will stir you up and you come to church. You come to church saying Hercules, Hercules. And the Lord says, stop saying Hercules. I want you to obey me now. And you got to change. And that preacher got to preach that word and they let the Holy Spirit lead him. Reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. You got to keep on indoctrinating the church. Everybody say it. Indoctrinate the church. You got to indoctrinate the church. When the church is indoctrinated, what happens is you're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and the cunning slateness of men. When you see people always working in, coming in and disturbing members of the church because they've not been taught. They're, they're being tossed to and fro like children. But when you grow up in Christ and you are indoctrinated, Nobody can come over to you and just be saying any and everything. And that's one of the things that's happening in this area. You got different churches who haven't been taught. And so consequently, you got these different concepts going on. You got to make sure that you are sound in the doctrine and you know what the doctrine and that preacher got to preach with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to fables or stories. Then he tells the evangelist, but watch thou in some things. Huh? You gotta watch all things. Let me tell you what that means. I was in a church and when you walk down the aisle, they had a, 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 a split in, on the carpet. And the evangelist sitting up in the church every day, walking down the aisle, split in the carpet. Now watch this. I'm walking in the church like a Christian student, and I trip, bust my head. What does that mean? Ching, ching, ching. I'm ready to sue the church. The evangelist wasn't watching in all things. He got to watch everything. Last night I was up preaching, and I'm when I'm preaching, I'm I'm watching everything. I mean, I'm watching everything. I'm watching all y'all. Just like y'all watching me, I'm watching you too. But there was a brother in that hallway, and I kept. He was standing there. And I said, oh, Lord, I hope I hope he's a security man because <laughs> he sure was standing back there. And so after the service over, I said, brother, I saw you standing back there. Are you security? He said, yes, I am. I told I said to brother uh, Hubbard earlier during the week, I said, do y'all have security? He said, yeah. I said, who is it? He said, I'm not going to tell you. He'd be bothering me. But I learned that man was the security guard. You see, he's covering us. You see. The evangelist got to watch in all things. Be, you got to do the work of the evangelist. You got to be alert. You got to be vigilant. You got to pay attention. You can't be half stepping in this thing. This thing is spiritual warfare. So you got to watch in all things, do the work of the evangelist. You see that? That's what he's talking about. Let's give him a love deposit, ladies and gentlemen. All right, one more thing you learned on yesterday. One more thing you learned on yesterday. Go right ahead, ma'am.
we're gonna wait till you get the mics because we, we this is on internet go ahead i learned that healthy church families are respectable responsible accountable uh flexible and uh, available for one another look at that let's give her a love deposit Okay, now, now, see, now, I'm one of them kind of preachers. I expect you to grow. In pedagogy, in all pedagogy, the student will rise to the level of the teacher. Well, a lot of times, ministers don't only expect people to grow. So I'm going to ask us to talk about it. what does that mean? This, we're talking about all church members got to know five things. What are they going to be? Respectable. What does that mean? Everybody, don't everybody speak at the same time and don't y'all take all my time. Come on. Come on, y'all. What does that mean? Huh? You got to respect the teacher. You got to respect the evangelist. You got to respect the leadership. That's why the Bible says, know them that labor among you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 12. Know them that labor among you and esteem them or respect them highly for their work's sake. That's what that means. Let's give him a love deposit. Come on. All right. You got to be accountable. What does that mean? What's that? Accountable. What does that mean? Accountable. Now, y'all, y'all, you need to know something about me. I'm a master teacher. So I'll sit up here and look into you until you say something. Let me tell you something. You can put something out and just be quiet. People, somebody gonna say something. You follow? Okay. Who wanna raise your raise your hand? Okay. We need a roving mic, people. Somebody who can move around with that mic. It moves quickly. It's expedited. Get the mics to them. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, accountable accountability means you have to do what you say you're going to do. Okay. And and if you don't, then there will be consequences if you don't. Okay. Now make it plain. Okay. In re- in regards to the church. Okay. You can do what you're supposed to do. If not, you're being accountable. Okay. All right, you out. You going out of town? Mm-hmm. You a member of the body? You a member of the church? Do you let the church know where you're going? You don't have to let them know where you're going. So some of you may be going some places you don't want to let the church know. But you need to let the church know you're going. All right. Accountability is something as simple as this, brothers and sisters. I, uh, I I'm going to be on the road and I'm going to be going to Virginia. Please pray for me. I want to give my family accountability. Now you're not. Commanded to do that, you do it because you feel love. Let me see who's a husband and a husband and wife in here. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Somebody who's a husband and wife. All right. Now, if you uh, if you leave town, do you let your wife know you leave in town? Yeah. And when he leaves town, do you worry about him when he's gone? You still worry about him? <laughs> okay. But if he lets you know and he's accountable to you and lets you know where he's going, let's say he's going to. Uh, a friend or uh, you know where he's at right so you don't worry about it right no you don't worry about it do you you do she, she loved you man she loved you brother <laughs> she, she, when you go on she cared about you <laughs> the po- the point is this here's the point when you are a healthy family you're always accountable you don't be going out of town and don't tell your wife or going out of town and the children don't tell the father that's not healthy a healthy family is accountable to one another. If you come to Mender Street, you'll find this happening every Sunday, every week. People will come down, brothers and sisters, I'm going, uh, we're going to be out of town this Sunday. We'll be worshiping over at, at uh, uh, the whatever congregation. Please pray for us. Nobody makes them do it. Healthy families are accountable to one another. Amen. And then they leave their contribution too. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to be out of town. I want to leave my contribution. And then if the elders are on point and the leaders are on point, you make it known to the whole church. Brothers and sisters, so-and-so are out of town, but they left their contribution. We want to give it to the treasurer. Next thing you know, people start going. They start following suit. Those people who are mature and those people who feel loved. You see? All the time. What is that? Family accountability and family responsibility. What does that mean? You're supposed to give upon the first day of the week as God prosper you every week as God prosper you. Whether you go out of town, whether you go to Disneyland, whether you go to SeaWorld, you're still supposed to leave your contribution. There are some of us, you take your contribution and give it to SeaWorld. 
and the Lord's house is over here, and those Lord's house is over here suffering, and you up here clapping for, for Shamu. What you got to understand is God holds you accountable for that. You see? So, responsibility. Now, family availability. Okay. Well, how can you be taught and help if you're not available? There's some things that said tonight that there are some people in this church won't get it because they are not here. There were some things said last night that people didn't get because they're not here. Now, let me tell you something. God used the coin to name fellowship. Where he will say certain things that sometimes it's the answer to your problem, it's the answer to your issue, and you're not in there to get it. That's kind of like the football player. He's a he's a he's a quarterback. He don't throw the pass to where the receiver uh, uh, is. He throw the pass to where the receiver's supposed to be. If he's not in the right place, he don't get the pass. Some of y'all don't miss your blessing because you wasn't in the right place at the right time. And that's why we got to understand the notion of family availability. And then there's one other. Family flexibility or family spirituality. Eighth chapter of the book of John, the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. You got to be free enough to be flexible enough so that you can be a healthy church. Let's get that sister a love deposit, ladies and gentlemen. Great point. One other. Was there one other? Okay, one other. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, um, I learned about um, to grow, to become a deacon and an evangelist, uh, the steps to get there. Yeah. I did learn about that, uh, which is very good because, you know, some people just don't know yeah. until it's been said. Yeah. I've been taught. We've been talking about the biblical model on the government organization and development of the local church. And this church is poised to start a eldership deaconship training where you have men and their wives who will be in the training process. And Brother Hubbard, the evangelist of the church, is working with these men. And there are certain things that you got to understand about that. So I'm going to move to that real quick and, and talk about that. Let's give him a love deposit, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, let's talk about eldership deaconship training. Eldership deaconship training. Let me tell you something. We got elders who've been in training for 30 years and they're elders in training. We got deacons in training. Because when you arrive, you're in trouble. When a deacon or elder get to a point where they think they don't arrive, that means they don't capped off and now the member's going to be limited to where they are. I'm an evangelist. I am constantly growing, constantly in training. And I've been doing this for 41 years. So when we talk about this training process, we're talking about elders and deacons in training. And they have to, first of all, understand the biblical model of the organization and government of the local church. Now, I'm going to see how much y'all, uh, y'all going to see, I'm going to see if y'all follow. I'm moving as fast as y'all move, okay? When we talk about the organization and government of the church, the red line means what? Christ is authority, all right? And what does Christ Authority mean. Christ is what? Monarch. What else? Potentate. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The church belonged to him. No man, no person is the one who owns the church. And when you find these preachers own their church, it's because they are violating the word of God. Al Green, he wasn't even thinking about a church. He was singing love and happiness until that woman threw them grits on him. When she threw those grips on him, he started his church. George Foreman, he, he, he started his church after they knocked him senseless one time. He was in the back room and he said he saw a vision and he started his church. Many churches have been established by men, but ladies and gentlemen, the church belonged to who? Christ. That's why the Bible said the churches of Christ salute you. And therefore, this, this means that Christ has all the authority in the church. No man has the authority. Not the evangelist, not the elder. All authority is given to Christ. And what does he do with the authority, ladies and gentlemen? Somebody tell me. He does what? He then gives that authority to the apostles and prophets by the inspiration of the word of God and the spirit of God. And what does the apostles and prophets do? 
Oh, y'all making me feel good. You're making me feel good. Make me feel like I'm learning and that I'm growing. He writes it down so that the evangelist can take the word of God and teach and train the church. Ephesians chapter three, verse number one, Paul said, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me that you would, how that by revelation he made known unto me, who, Paul? He made known unto me the mystery that I have wrote a four in few words. He wrote it down in the Bible. Then he said, whereby when you read, you might understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. But it is now revealed, I'm quoting it verbatim, which is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Anybody there? By the Spirit. That's why the Bible says the Lord gave the word. Great was the company to them that published it. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, the Bible says Jesus, many other signs, truly, John is the apostle. He said many other signs, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in these books. Do you know that there were a lot of things that Jesus did that wasn't written down, which are not written in these books, but these are written. The Bible, these are written that what? You might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And in believing, you might have life through his name. So the Bible is right. And all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I want you to see it's, it's profitable for doctrine. You got to keep indoctrinating the members of the church, keep indoctrinating the members of the church. And that's how churches be strong. Ministers who don't continue to indoctrinate the church will have a weak congregation and carnality will come into the church. And next thing you know, the church is out of order. Amen. Now, this evangelist, what does he do? He set up a training program. That's what's happening in this church. That's what we do. We met just a few minutes ago. Brother Hubbard got a training program that he's setting forth in this church. And you don't teach a church in the vacuum. You got to let the whole church know what's going on. And that's what we're doing right now. See? Why? Because if the church don't know who's going to be the prospective leaders, how are they going to be able to respect them? Y'all can say amen when you can. If you don't want to say amen, just nod your head. Make me feel good. That's, that, that. And then this training program is to train what? Elders and deacons. That's why it's called elders and deacons in training. Well, what are the qualifications? There are no qualifications. There's a personality profile. When you have a qualification, you got a hit list. And that's what's been hitting the Lord's church for years. Look at a young man. The young man got all kind of potential. You got people got all kind of potential. You come over there and then you're going to start using a hit list. Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? There's not a doctor you know that came to the table already qualified. Tell the truth when you take, say amen when you can. Do you know there's not a football player who comes to the table already qualified? They all got to be trained. So training is essential for the maturity of the saints. That's why the Bible says all scriptures given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, doctrine, for, for reproof, correction, for instructions in righteousness. Look what the word instruction means. It means training in righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Right living. Training in right living that the man of God may be mature. See, you train the men of God and the women of God so they can mature. And when you do so, the church mature. Amen. And then you got to train teachers in the Lord's church. All right. Now, the sound doctrine training program includes three components that's very essential. The organization, government of the local church. God's love bank, a curriculum, and God's honor seeker. Every church got to have a curriculum because teaching is the lifeblood of a church. When churches don't have curriculum, what happens is the church won't be growing. That's why Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all following me? Then what did he say? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And then the God's on the secret approach is, is real simple. It's a powerful way of teaching the gospel. Let me tell you something. Every conversion story in the New Testament happens the same way. 
God brings an honest seeker in contact with an honest teacher. He creates the circumstance for the honest seeker and the honest teacher to meet. And that honest seeker have a life changing event. Every conversion story in the New Testament. Y'all remember the Ethiopian eunuch? He was the honest seeker. What did God do? He brought him in contact with Philip. He was the honest teacher. And then he created a circumstance for them to meet on the road. And that caused that person to be converted. God always worked the same way. You can go through all the New Testament uh, uh, biblical stories. I used to go, do, I used to do workshops, Brother Hubbard, called God's Honest Seeker Workshop. And I would go all over the country and do those workshops. Baptize, we, we, we baptize all kinds of people. I teach people how to use the God's Honest Seeker approach. And then next thing you know, people start baptizing. At our congregation, when, when, when our elders come down, see all of our elders come down to minister to the people. And many times you have people who come to the congregation who are not members of the body of Christ. If you know how to handle it, you can teach people the gospel every Lord's day. Because you have a person over here who's a visitor. And let's say they visit for a while and they visit for a while and then they come down and they ask for prayer. Then you administer to them and you find out if they are honest seeker. Now, if they are honest seeker, you align the honest seeker in contact with the honest teacher. So what we may do is we have an honest seeker who come down and they visit it for a while. And I say, this, they come down and ask for prayer. We say, well, thank God you came. We're here. We want to make sure we minister to you. So we're going to have Brother Hubbard and Sister Hubbard meet with you. And then you meet with them into the sad. And they teach them the honest seeker approach. You baptize people all the time. I wouldn't be surprised if we baptized somebody last week. In fact, we did. Last week and the week before that. We just baptized a denominational preacher. A church of God in Christ preacher. You see? So it's all about that honest seeker approach. It's, the, you know, the evangelist of peace. Now, with that in mind, remember, we learned that you got to have a training program during the time when the church is going through a temporary period of time. For example, the Bible says, when we look at it, when the church was first established on the day of Pentecost in AD 33, elders and deacons had not been proven or appointed in the church. It wasn't until AD 41 that the apostles ordained elders and deacons in the church, Acts 11, verse 30. And then in Acts in AD 45, uh, uh, they then worked with the church and ordained them, which means the church goes through a period of maturing, and that's when you got to have leaders in training and that's what his church is he said then you put those leaders in training and brother hubbard will eventually come before this church and let you know and get the church's involvement in the leadership of this church and those men go into training now i'm moving us on i could go on and that's we went through all of this yesterday now these leaders must be proven first see one of the uh Personality profiles for an elder or deacon, they must first be proven. Well, how are they proven? They're proven through the training process. How long is the training process? As long as the evangelist needs to work with them. It may be years, but you're working with them. And when you have elders and deacons in training, you know what the church does? The church says, <sighs> and then eventually those men become ordained elders and deacons. And they will be elders and leaders in training at that point. You follow me? I'm not going to keep us long tonight. Y'all been here. I just want to give the five designations of the church. Y'all remember? Now, if you know those five designations, you'll know how to act in the church, in the body of Christ. I'm going to close with this one. Here's the eldership deaconship training that y'all need to know. When Brother Hubbard works with these men and their wives, Here's the way it's set up. Those men have to be accountable to the training. And their wives have to be accountable. They have to be responsible. If a man won't be responsible, if a man is not committed, if a man, you can't count on the man, you expecting the man to be there and he won't be there, or you expecting the man to, to, to take responsibility of something, he don't need to be a leader. You know why? He's not responsible. He had to have family accountability, family responsibility. Then he got to have family availability. How can the evangelist train a man who won't come to church? How can the evangelist train a man and he won't be responsible and accountable and available? See, 
So part of being in eldership, deaconship training, you've got to be available, you've got to be responsible, and you've got to be accountable. And if you're not, you weed your own self out of the training. Y'all follow me? All right. Now, he got to be respectable. He can't just be doing any and everything. Hanging out with family all night, Friday night, and then hanging out with Susie all night, and then come home, bring his wife to church, and everybody know he's been with Bambi and Susie. I'm not just picking on men. Sometimes, you know, the, 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 the woman is, is out there. See, he got to be respectable, and then he got to be spiritual. Okay, so this training process is where Brother Hubbard will have men who are in eldership, deaconship training, and they got to be accountable, responsible, respectable. What does that mean? Simply means that they got to be trained. And this training process occurs over a period of time. And the whole church know it. The whole church see it. That's why you can't teach elders and deacons in a back room or in a vacuum. It got to be taught like it's doing right now. That's why Brother Hubbard is having this workshop. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience. I'm going to stop right there and take a few questions if you have it. That's where this church is right now. But Hubbard will be coming before this church with the people who will be in the training process and the church then will work with that process. Any questions? I told the brother, I told the brother, I said, I told this gentleman right here, I said, you didn't ask any questions last night. He said, you must have did a pretty good job, man. <laughs> Go right ahead, man. Brother Roach, this is a question about something you said last night. Okay. Um, you said, if we close our spirit to another brother or sister, means we close our spirit to God. Right. And so I was going to ask you, did you have some scriptures, new scriptures? Go over to Revelation chapter 3, look at verse number 20. Somebody else get from me. Matthew chapter 6. Look at number 9. Now basically, here's what happens when the spirit closes. The spirit is who you are. We are what? Spirits. We have what? Soul. We live where? In bodies. Okay. My spirit is the real me. That's who I am. Okay. And my body is the house that my spirit lives in. Okay, so when a person's spirit closes, they either get wounded, they get hurt, they get damaged, or offended. And when they get offended, they back themselves up like a turtle in a shell and begin to protect themselves because they've been hurt, or like a hermit crab, and they'll put their claws out and protect themselves because they've been hurt. And see, what we got to understand is the spirit is fragile and gentle. It's a gentle, quiet spirit women have, for example. All right, so let's say, for example, someone offends me. My spirit closes to protect myself, okay? And when my spirit closes, now, uh, I wish I had, you know, in the God's Love Bank, uh, uh, this is what Brother Hubbard was talking about that makes me frustrated. See, in the God's Love Bank material, I cover open and closing spirits. One of these days, I'm going to do that here. But, but, but the idea is, so what happens is when the spirit closes, now nothing can get in. Why? Because it's closed. Christ can't get in. The Holy Spirit can't get in. Uh, uh, the truth can't get in. Love can't get in. Intimacy can't get in. So they close, right? And that's why the Bible says whenever, whenever you hear the word heart in the New Testament, it also includes the spirit. Because the spirit lives inside of the heart. The spirit and heart are like wet and water. You can't have wet without water. You can't have water without wet. Can, can you say amen? It's like hot and heat. Wherever there's heat, there's some hot. Wherever there's some hot, there's some heat. And if you're not careful, you can have some fire. Now, 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 so, so whenever you hear the Spirit, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Why do you say all your heart? Because the Spirit lives inside of the heart. When he talks about over there in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, he talks about the woman. He says, not the outward adorning, the wearing the hair, the braiding of the gold, but it is the hidden person of the heart, watch this now, which is a gentle and quiet spirit. 
There's a many a man white right now, spirit closed. He don't even know it. A person can close their spirit. And when they close their spirit, they can be looking at you with their body, but their spirit is closed. Okay, so now Revelation, anybody got it? Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 20. What does the Bible say? Okay, now, now this is the Holy Spirit talking. Because if you look at verse number 22, it says, He who have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. All right, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The door of what? Your spirit. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't come and occupy your body. He goes through your spirit, spiritual things. Okay. Now, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, what? Hold it. If anyone hear my voice and opens the door. Now, who does the opening? We do. So, therefore, you do the closing. Say amen when you can. Now, if you close your spirit, rather than open your spirit, you won't get what's coming next. Read. I, the spirit says, I will come into him. How are you going to get in there if it's cold? And when I get into him, what am I going to do? I'm going to commune with him. The number one purpose of the Holy Spirit is to commune with your spirit. That's what he's here for. The communion of the Holy Spirit. So he wants to come in and commune with you. But if your spirit is closed, he can't get to you because your spirit is closed. Well, what causes your spirit to close? When you get hurt or you close your spirit to another person by hurting them and they close their spirit. Now you close your spirit to God. And when you close your spirit to that person, close their spirit, you close your spirit to God. And guess what? Now you close your spirit to yourself. And I said this last night. I'm almost sure there's some closed spirits in this church. Because there's been some hurt going on and God is healing in this church. That's what he's doing. He's healing. And let me tell you something. You can always tell if you've been hurt, if you've been offended. My brother last night, he came down and you know what? He was an example of the believers. He owned it. If you don't own that your spirit is closed, guess what? The devil will use you. And you will not be able to forgive another person. So I want to show you something about forgiveness. All right. Go over there to uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Anybody there? Start reading. Uh-huh. 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 Uh -huh. Read. Uh-huh. 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 Hold it. Your debts are forgiven based on how you forgive others. You don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. You close your spirit to others, God can't forgive you because you close your spirit to that person. Drop down, I think, to verse number 17 where it says what? But you fast, anoint your head. Okay, go, to, go, go where it says, uh, but if your brother trespass against you, is that there in that text? 15. Verse 15, read that. You, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, uh -huh. neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Uh -huh. Well, Good. Look, if you don't forgive me and their trespasses, God can't forgive you. I never forget one time I was I was in some city and I was teaching and preaching and, and the sister came, I went to that passage. It says, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, then your heavenly father can't forgive you. She walked over to me and she said, Brother, what about sister? I said, What you talking about? What about sister? She said, It says me. What if you called your spirit to a sister? I said, sister, you can't have one man without man. Say man when you can. You can't have lady without lad. Say man when you can. You, 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 you can't have she without he. You take away the he, you got shh. You take a woman, you take away the man out of woman, what you got? Whoa. And you take away the lad out of lady, guess what? The, you got a big old why? <laughs> Y'all get it later on. Y'all, I'm just trying to say it. When God made man, he made one man, four man. And that woman was over there getting caught up with the notion where it says, if you won't forgive men, their trespasses, your heavenly father won't forgive you. And she over here trying to get through the cracks and say, well, I got a sister I haven't forgiven. It didn't save women. And after, I, after 
We got to finish. She repented. Go right ahead. If you can tell that somebody has a closed spirit, somebody with a closed spirit, is there a way to, to help them in getting their spirit to open back up so that they can be more receptive to, to hearing God's word and, and helping them? That's a great question. So y'all, y'all dealing with the God's love bank stuff now. Yeah, I'm just, I just put it out there. Okay, yes, you can, you can help another person open their spirit. You got to know how to talk to them. Though. When you talk to another person's spirit, you got to understand how to talk to them. You see, so if a person's spirit is closed, you got to talk to them sort of like this. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Who lives in the heart? Got to talk to the spirit. When you're talking to a person's spirit, you can help them open their spirit by raising questions to them. That's why God started in the beginning. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? What did he ask them? Where are you? You think he didn't know where they were? He was trying to propagate redemptive struggle in the very spirit of the man. Say amen when you can. And so you can do things like that. Yeah. And you know what? You got to, you got to, sometimes when you're talking to a woman and her spirit is closed, you can't be saying, Move! What's wrong with you? You get on my nerve. You know, <laughs> you know why? Because the Bible says it's not the outward adorning, the wearing of the gold or the braiding of the head, but it's the hidden person of the heart, which is a gentle and quiet spirit. Sometimes you got to lower your voice. Baby, you know you're right. You know you're wrong as you can be. But I ain't going to say anything. <laughs> the Bible's still right. <laughs> you got to know how to talk to them. Man. You know what I'm saying? Does that help a little bit? Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, y'all been a wonderful audience. I want you to know I appreciate so much the time that we spent together. And I hope you receive some things that will help you grow and develop. And I commend you to the Spirit of God and his blessing. And I trust that uh, you will take something that's been said, uh, 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 communicated, and incorporated in your life and help others to do the same. Thank you so much. We turn things now over to your very fine evangelist, Brother Willie Hubbard.